Hi, I'm Jeff Boyd. I want to talk to you about my passion. Even though quantum mathematics is the most powerful science ever, nevertheless, because of symmetry, we don't live in the universe described by quantum mechanics. Consider two symmetrical universes, two ways of seeing reality, of seeing the nature of within which we live. On the left-hand side of your screen, we will have quantum mechanics, in which it is assumed that waves and particles go in the same direction. And this has been a very logical and very, very productive mansion of quantum mechanics that has been built over the past century. But there's something weird. There's a lot of weird things about it, especially in the area of wave function collapse. I mean, for example, Schrodinger's cat. Another example is that some people would say that if I have an odd thought in my brain, it's because a particle inside my head was immediately and non-locally affected by something on the other side of the galaxy, a hundred thousand light years away. That makes no sense. So it's been a very, very productive thing. But as Feynman says, no one understands the universe as described by quantum mechanics. And if they claim to, they're lying. On the right-hand side of your screen, we're going to build a different universe. It's going to be symmetrical in the sense that this one's based on the idea of waves and particles going in the same direction. Whereas the new universe on the right is based on the assumption that waves and particles go in opposite directions and is completely compatible with quantum mathematics. Now, if you choose to go in this direction over here, you'll find a lot, lot of logical ideas, but ultimately you're going to be dwelling in a house where you're going to go crazy. Things don't quite make sense. Whereas if you follow me down this path over here, you'll feel as if you're going crazy because I'm going to be talking about a lot of counterintuitive ideas that sound insane. And you're going to be saying, oh, so this guy's a psychiatrist. He's trying to drive us nuts. But I can explain and will explain later in this video why particles would follow waves backwards. There's a lot of apparently counterintuitive ideas, but that's what you get with a new science. If you choose to follow me in this direction and not simply turn off the video, then you will discover something astounding that in this universe over here, which I'm going to call the elementary wave universe, things make sense. That when you look at the big picture, reality looks like that which we are familiar with you will say, aha, I'm home. So in this video, we're going to take the mansion of quantum mechanics, which has been built over the past century, and we're going to put steel beams under it and jack it up off of its foundations so that we will draw a distinction between quantum mathematics and the assumptions of quantum mechanics. We're going to say that this top one, quantum mathematics, is very, very valuable. The bottom one is erroneous. On, on this side over here, on the right-hand side of your screen, we're going to build a new foundation called Elementary Wave Theory, and we're going to take the house of quantum, the mansion of quantum mathematics, and transport it over here and put it on new foundations. Now, you might say, why should we listen to you? Who are you? Where is your Nobel Prize? You are a physician and a psychiatrist. Well, I mean, like, what could I say? It just happens I've published more on this subject than anyone else on Earth. I've published more than a dozen scholarly articles in peer-reviewed journals of physics and mathematics. Check out my website, elementarywave.com. But I'm a gadfly. That's my credentials. You should not take me seriously. What you should take seriously is the question inside your heart, which is, and you know this question, do you believe the quantum world, the, the universe given to you by quantum mechanics, makes sense? Is that the world you live in? Or are you interested in finding an alternative? That's all this video is about. It's not about me.
This is the second of seven lessons trying to systematically explain elementary wave theory. This one will focus on zero energy waves and the next one will focus on why those waves go backwards and then we will talk about the substantial amount of empirical evidence supporting this point of view in future lessons. My favorite lessons, the ones I had most fun making, are number five about the Purcell effect and especially number six explaining complementarity in a stern gerlach magnet experiment. But this one right now is just about zero energy waves. Imagine that there are two universes that are so symmetrical that they share exactly the same mathematics. Now, as you know, I am a psychiatrist. I deal with many universes. Just this week, I was dealing with someone who is living in a universe in which everyone is spying on him. There are microphones in the walls. The conspiracy is trying to convince his friends and neighbors that he is a terrorist, whereas he's the most peaceful person on Earth. There might even possibly be a conspiracy to murder him. He lives in terror. Now, that's not a universe that I live in, but he does. And that's what I do as a psychiatrist. I shift gears from one universe to another. There's another universe I ran into this week. A woman who is sure that all the shrubs around our buildings have been brought here by aliens and are putting out poisonous gas for the purpose of exterminating the human race. So she went recently to a McDonald's hamburger. In, in the summertime, the, the door to the kitchen was open, and she looked and she saw, look, here are shrubs, and here's the door to the kitchen, and they're cooking hamburgers and food right there where the poisonous gas from the shrubs is getting into the food. So this woman did what any responsible human being would do. She phoned 911 and the police, when they came, didn't understand what she was talking about and brought her to the hospital where I treated her. Now, every time I have treated her in the hospital, I have always told her the same thing, which is, don't ever talk to the police. They're not going to understand. So that's another universe that I've experienced this past week. There's another universe in which Schrodinger's cat put in a box is neither dead nor alive, but in a superposition of both states of being dead and alive simultaneously until someone opens the lid and looks, there is yet another universe that I don't live in. So you can see how I, as a psychiatrist, would have developed the delusion that I have something useful to say about different universes and how to shift gears and try to get out of the insane universes that many people live in and find a sensible universe. Now, I've been telling you in previous videos that the way to find a sensible universe is to adopt some insane ideas such as particles following waves backwards. As it turns out, insane ideas in science lead to a sensible universe, whereas sensible ideas lead to an insane universe, such as that of quantum mechanics. So now let's talk about the major issue that most viewers have with this new universe over here. It is the idea that particles follow zero energy waves backwards. That's simply unacceptable to most people. It's generally thought, for example, that in order for a particle to be involved with a wave, you're going to need a wave with energy. And when I say that these waves convey zero energy, people just say, ha, that's ridiculous. The answer to that was stated in 1603 when Hamlet said, there are more things in heaven and earth Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. And the word philosophy in 1603 meant the same thing as the word science means today. Now there are two kinds of waves. On the one hand, there are waves like ocean waves and electromagnetic waves that carry 
energy and on the other hand there are the waves of quantum mechanics which carry probability amplitudes but not energy. The Schrodinger equation, for example, the most important of all the equations, is a wave equation about probability amplitudes and not about energy. Now you might ask, why would a particle follow a, a probability amplitude wave? Well, the answer is that is simply what a probability amplitude is. It is an animal that, when squared, tells you the probability that a particle will be found at that location. Now you might say, good grief, this idiot is confusing Hilbert space with Cartesian space. Well, the problem is that you've been reading textbooks of quantum mechanics and you have not yet read the textbook of elementary wave theory, and the reason is because that textbook has not yet been written. Guess what? In that textbook it says that elementary waves travel in this space here, Cartesian space, and carry probability amplitudes. Where did the idea come from that particles can follow probability amplitudes that are stretched as a path through space? Richard Feynman wrote a very famous book called QED, and he talks about what it takes for photons to go from a light source over here to a detector. And he talks about these little tiny spinning arrows, which is a simplified way of talking about probability amplitudes. What he's talking about is rays that go from the light source over here to the detector and they are probability amplitude waves. They are not energy waves and they radiate out from the light source in all directions and that's how the photon decides which way to go. Now Feynman's interest and my interest are slightly different. He's interested in taking all the different rays, all the different pathways he calls them, and adding them together to get the total probability amplitude. I'm interested in taking simply one of those rays of probability amplitude. So according to Feynman, these rays carry probability amplitudes over here and quantify which direction a photon will go. But he presents no evidence whatsoever that these rays, which carry no energy, go in this direction. I claim they go in this direction, and I'm calling them elementary waves. These waves are a little bit tricky. They go in this direction here, but they carry with them a probability amplitude that has a flux or probability current that goes in this direction. In lesson three, we will address which way the waves are going. This lesson has been more devoted to the question of how to understand zero energy waves Although I'm making a lot of this stuff up as I go along, so you've got a kind of stream of consciousness meandering. Meandering is a characteristic of gadflies. The question you should be asking yourself is, can this weird guy perhaps help me figure out how to hold on to the enormously valuable parts of quantum mechanics, which is mostly to say quantum mathematics, but get rid of the weirdness so that when I look at the world, it looks more realistic, like the world I know. As I said earlier, most people confronted with the idea of zero energy waves think zero energy waves cannot exist. And yet, in another part of the brain, they're thinking, well, of course, you know, Quantum waves uh, carry no energy, they carry probability amplitudes. They, they have these two ways of thinking, and there's a brick wall between them, and I know all I'm doing is tearing down the brick wall. When Jeff Boyd talks about particles following zero energy waves, people say, he's a jerk! When Richard Feynman talks about particles following zero energy pathways, people say, he's a genius! Now you may wonder, what is it with the ocean waves? Well, in my view, what we're talking about is a sea change.
This is the third lesson in this series, Systematically Explaining Elementary Wave Theory. So far, in the previous lesson, we talked about why these are zero energy waves. Now, in this lesson, we'll talk about the fact that they go backwards. In other words, the waves go in one direction and particles follow the waves backwards. After the end of this lecture, we will turn to the enormous amount of the empirical evidence that supports this point of view. I've been talking in previous videos about the idea that there are two symmetrical universes, both of which use quantum mathematics. They are symmetrical in the sense that this one over here, the quantum mechanics one, is based on the idea that waves and particles go in the same direction. And this one over here, the elementary wave one, is based on the idea that they go in opposite directions. So they're symmetrical in that respect, and the symmetry is evident in the fact that they have the same mathematics. I will show in future lessons that they share the same mathematics. Now you may be asking yourself, why am I listening to this outsider who is neither a physicist nor a chemist on the subject which amounts to a new formulation of the foundations of quantum physics? Well, the fact of the matter is, when a paradigm shift comes along, as it has in this case, sometimes it's an outsider who would be able to present it to you without a risk to losing his career. If I were a physicist saying these things, the establishment would tar and feather me because of presenting a heretical idea. I mean, that's what this comes to. Orthodoxy versus heresy. And I am presenting myself not only as a gadfly, but also as a heretic. So in this universe over here, the elementary wave one, we have zero energy waves coming from all the detectors and impinging on the particle source, and then particles follow them backwards. Now, how can there be all these elementary waves? So I've got elementary waves all over the place. Now, where do they come from? Well, according to our theory, elementary wave theory, we live in an ocean of elementary waves. Everywhere in space, at all points, there are elementary waves of all frequencies going in all directions, carrying no energy. We live in an ocean of wave interference of which we are unaware. How do we know they exist? Well. We know they exist from inference. We only know about elementary waves because of particles hitting one detector or another, and the particles tell us by inference about the elementary wave which they are following. One of the founders of elementary wave theory is Franco Salieri, an Italian physicist from, from the University of Bari. He studied zero energy waves, which he called quantum waves without a particle. He had them going in the wrong direction, but he studied them and he came to the conclusion that this whole idea of zero energy waves all over the place is the equivalent of Lorentz ether at rest. We're not going to go into that here, but it's a whole other example of how elementary wave theory leads you off in dozens of different directions. It's such a rich subject. We shift gears now from elementary waves all over the place to the question of wave function collapse. Perhaps the most decisive difference between elementary wave theory and quantum mechanics concerns the question, when does wave function collapse occur? Does it occur at the target when a particle is about to be detected, or does it occur when the particle is fired at the electron gun? So if I stand here with a gun, okay, a regular old pistol, and I'm aiming it at a target, and I pull the trigger, bang, uh, and then a dot appears on the target. So the, the quiz is this. Which world, which universe do you live in? Which universe do you think is more consistent with reality as you experience it, with nature as you know it? Is it more consistent to say 
that all the different possibilities for that bullet collapse into one uh, specific reality when a dot appears on the target? Is that, is that how you think the world works? Or is it more consistent with your experience to say that uh, all the different possibilities collapse into one particular reality when the bullet is fired? According to elementary wave theory, all the probabilities for that bullet collapse into one specific reality when the trigger is pulled and the bullet is fired. This has big implications for Schrodinger's cat. As you know, the idea is you take a cat and put it in a box along with a lump of uranium and a Geiger counter and if over the next hour the uranium deteriorates and the Geiger counter pings, then a hammer falls down, breaks a tube of cyanide and the cat dies. So there's a 50-50 chance of the cat being alive or dead over the course of one hour and you don't know which is true. Now according to quantum mechanics, wave function collapse occurs when you look at something, when you detect something. So when you look in the box, that's when the cat becomes dead or alive and prior to that the cat was in a superposition of being both dead and alive. According to our theory, uh, wave function collapse occurs when a particle e is emitted. When the gun is fired. Now, what does that mean? Well, the, the Geiger counter inside this box is always putting out elementary waves in all directions and some of them are bathing and, and impinging on this lump of uranium. At random, one of the particles in one of the nucleuses of the uranium lump decides, man, it's time for me to follow this wave. And so it jumps out of the nucleus and the nucleus disintegrates and as an alpha particle it follows that wave backwards to the Geiger counter from which the wave is coming and the Geiger counter pings and the rest is history. So that, in our theory, is when wave function collapse occurs, is when the, when the alpha particle leaves uh, the lump of uranium. You may say to me, look, I like the idea of wave function collapse occurring at the moment when an electron is fired. That does seem to be the way the world works, but I hate the idea of particles following waves backwards. Well, the trouble is, these are two sides of the same coin. When an electron is fired, it already seems to have a lot of information about its environment. It doesn't just produce a scattered shot. It produces a pattern, like in the double slit experiment, a wave pattern, for example. Now, how does the electron know all that? Well, it has had spies out there bringing it advanced information. And what does that mean? That means that before the electron decided to take an action, it already knew a lot, which means that the waves were bringing information to the electron before the electron was fired. One of the things I hope to show you is that the empirical experimental evidence supports elementary wave theory better than it supports quantum mechanics. We'll show that in future videos, but I'll talk about one experiment now. Helmut Rauch from Vienna had a research team that developed the basics of neutron interferometry. I'm going to talk about one of many aspects of one of these studies, a study published in 1992 in Physical Reviews by Helmut Kaiser, Russell Clothier, Samuel Werner, and Helmut Rauch. So up here you have a source of neutrons that come down here through an interferometer. They bounce off various silicon plates and they come out the bottom where they reach a detector. Now because when they split inside the interferometer there is an oscillating aluminum plate, therefore the phase of one wave inside the interferometer psi 1 differs from the phase of the other wave, psi 2, and then they are recombined in the final 
silicon plate before they leave the interferometer and because of that plates oscillating therefore there is interference of those two phases and that's detected down here by the detector. Now bismuth is a metal that slows down neutrons and neutron waves and they put a sample of bismuth in the upper path. As they increase the thickness of the bismuth from 0 to 1 to 2 to 20 millimeters, it slows down the neutron wave packet going through the upper trajectory. And as it slows it down, there's less and less overlap between that wave packet and the other wave packet on the lower trajectory when they rejoin before leaving the interferometer. And therefore, there is a dampening and less and less interference, less and less sine waves as you add more and more bismuth. And eventually, when you get to 10 or 20 millimeters of bismuth, the upper wave packet misses the boat and doesn't get to the final destination before the other wave packet has left the interferometer and there is no more interference at all. As you add more and more bismuth the amount of interference dies out to zero and that's what's seen by the detector down here. Now they repeat exactly the same experiment with one tiny exception which is that down here they place a silicon analyzer crystal, the nature of which is to reduce the breadth of scatter of the beam of neutrons and to increase the height of the center of the Gaussian curve. So the beam penetrates more, but that analyzer crystal is down here, outside and downstream from the interferometer. Now you would not expect that to have a profound effect on the interference that is occurring upstream, but what do you know? It totally restores all the interference, even with a fat block of bismuth inside the interferometer. The experimenters said correctly that quantum mechanics cannot explain this. And they spoke of Wheeler's smoky dragon, meaning that sometimes unexplainable things happen in quantum experiments, and you are supposed to ignore them and pretend that quantum mechanics just works all the time. But if you think about it, if a analyzer crystal down here in front of the detector affects the interference, that means that the analyzer crystal must be upstream from the interference. So the waves are going in this direction. The waves start at the detector, they're going through the interferometer backwards up into the neutron source. Sometimes they recruit a neutron from a deteriorating atom and it follows the waves backwards and that explains the experimental data. From the EW point of view, interference is located in the silicon blade up in the top corner of the interferometer, and the waves are going in this way. The reason the analyzer crystal makes a difference is that without it, the waves simply cannot penetrate through a thick block of bismuth going in this direction, but with it, they can easily penetrate through and reach the neutron source. So that explains the data. So in this experiment, the evidence is clear that neutrons follow neutron waves backwards. This has been the third of seven lessons systematically teaching my understanding of elementary wave theory. In the second lesson, we talked about why these are zero energy waves. In the third lesson, we talked about evidence that particles follow waves backwards. Now we're going to talk in the remaining lessons about the substantial amount of empirical evidence that the empirical data support elementary wave theory better than they support quantum theory. This is the fourth in a series of lectures systematically explaining elementary wave theory. In the fifth lecture, we will discuss the Purcell effect where elementary waves can be seen so clearly. My favorite, actually, is lecture number six, in which I present an elementary wave explanation of complementarity in a stern gerlach magnet experiment. But this lecture, number four, will begin to explore more of the great mountain of empirical evidence supporting elementary wave theory. 
and compare it to the way in which quantum mechanics uses experimental data. Now just to remind you that we have two universes that are symmetrical. Both of them express quantum mathematics. If we go in this direction here, we take very logical steps that are easy to understand and we end up in the quantum universe, but the universe itself makes no sense. But on the other hand, if we go in this direction here, towards the elementary wave universe, we start with assumptions that sound absurd, preposterous, like particles follow zero energy waves backwards. And it's easy to say that's ridiculous, I'm not going to listen to it. But if you follow this ridiculous path in this direction, you end up in a universe that makes sense, that acts like the universe we actually live in. We recognize it. It seems like home. So you can take logical steps and end up in an insane place, or you can take insane steps and end up in a logical place. This is not the first time in history that insane steps have led to something logical. In 1912, Alfred Wegener published an article in which he said that all the continents had previously been part of one large continent for which he coined the term Pangaea and that it had broken apart and the continents were drifting apart after that. All the scientists on Earth said that is the most ridiculous thing we ever heard. Science knows of no force on Earth capable of moving continents across the face of the Earth they said, and they plugged their ears and refused to listen, and yet Wagner provided the key right there to plate tectonics, which today is the basis of all geology. So sometimes with a paradigm shift, you have to tolerate something that sounds ridiculous, especially if it leads someplace that looks familiar. Let's now get back to the basic purpose of this fourth lecture of the series in which we're beginning to discuss some of the empirical evidence. For example, we will now show the elementary wave explanation of the wave particle duality experiments. You look at those wave particle duality experiments. It's amazing. The Davison-Germer experiment, for example, the first one, that they fired electrons at, at a crystal of nickel and they detected the voltage with which those electrons came off the crystal and their data shows pretty clearly that there is a lot of interaction between the electrons and waves and that's where they concluded its wave particle duality but they never ever ever thought about the obvious uh, reason for that which is that the waves start at the detector go backwards through the crystal up into the electron gun and the electrons follow the waves backwards. So they, uh, their data are completely consistent with my theory. Here in greater detail is the Davison-Germer experiment. In the middle you'll see the nickel crystal and above it an electron gun shooting uh, electrons down and off to the right side a detector at angle theta. The detector can move to different angles. In the next slide you'll see some of their data. When they shoot electrons down at 36 volts they find electrons emerging from the crystal at different positions as noted by the red line. Here are electrons coming off the crystal when they are shot down at 36 volts and when they're shot down at 68 volts. The important one is this slide which shows that at 54 volts there is a spur in their data. This spur can only be explained if there are waves of wavelength 1.67 angstrom coming off the crystal with which the electrons are interacting. So the spur is the center of focus of the Davison-Germer results. As you can see from these data, there's nothing here that would tell you whether the waves are going in the opposite direction as the particles. They never thought about that. And uh, that's true when you look at all the other wave particle duality experiments, uh, none of them control for this possibility. Let's consider a more recent wave particle duality experiment published in Science in 2012 by Peruzzo et al. 
Now these guys used a Mach Zender interferometer. The nature of a Mach Zender interferometer is that it can differentiate waves versus particles. A particle will go across one of the two arms and strike a detector up here. A wave will go across both arms and cause interference up here. These clever fellows embedded such a Mach Zender interferometer into a quantum computer chip. And instead of testing wave versus particle, they used a photon up here called alpha to cause a gradient between testing it as a particle and testing it as a wave. And the, their data shown here, on the left hand side you'll see a vertical bar which is intensity. Across the middle phi means phase of the wave. And alpha on the right hand side is a continuous variable from 0 to pi over 2. At one extreme the wave particle acts like a particle, at the other extreme it acts as a wave, and in between there is a gradient from one to the other. So what do we learn from this experiment? The big thing we learn is that 16 years after the scientific community was alerted to the existence of elementary waves going in the opposite direction as the particles, these fellows simply ignored that and never tested which direction the particle goes relative to the wave. They made the far-fetched assumption that they both go in the same direction. Their experiment can be explained if the waves go in this direction and the particles go in this direction. Subsequently, I wrote to the same journal, Science, and said that there is evidence that the waves and particles go in opposite directions. In less than 15 minutes, the editor sent back an email saying, not the kind of thing we publish. I don't know for sure what the editor meant by saying not the kind of thing we publish, but I suspect what it means is this is heresy, not orthodoxy. You wonder why you only hear one side of this story. But now that we speak of it, let's talk about the whole idea of a wave particle. There is a wave particle in both quantum mechanics and a wave particle in elementary wave theory. Now in our wave particle, the wave and particle parts of it are going in opposite directions, but nevertheless, all we can ever see with our equipment is a wave particle. We cannot see a particle without a wave because there is never such a thing in nature, and we cannot see a wave without a particle because it has no energy. The main point is that the wave particle in elementary wave theory is virtually identical to the wave particle of quantum mechanics, except that our wave particle is more intelligent. It can know things about the detector ahead because the waves are coming from the detector to the particle. Speaking of empirical evidence, elementary wave theory also provides the only sensible explanation of the quantum eraser experiment, as you will discover in some of my other videos and published material. And in addition, believe it or not, we can explain all the Bell test experiments. In order to understand that, you're going to have to learn just a little bit about another, yet another crazy idea called by rays. Everywhere in space there is an elementary ray going in any direction at the speed of light and that means that every elementary ray has a mate, an identical elementary ray going coaxially in the opposite direction at the speed of light. We call this a by ray. Now what it means to be an entangled pair of particles is to be following the same bi ray in opposite directions. If this bi ray bathes a particle source and if a pair of photons is born in that condition then they are entangled because they're both following the same bi ray in opposite directions and it's easy to show that it is the nature of this bi ray that if Alice views her photon at angle theta 1 and Bob views his at angle theta 2 the probability of them both seeing a photon simultaneously is always going to be sine squared theta 2 minus theta 1 no matter when that observation is made and when Alice makes an observation it does not send a signal anywhere. The, the equation sine squared theta 2 minus theta 1 is embedded in the nature of the bi-ray itself 
and attachment to that bi-ray is acquired at birth. So that is a thumbnail sketch of the Bell test experiments. So I've been presenting some of the substantial empirical evidence supporting elementary wave theory. But let's turn for just a minute before we end this, our fourth video, and briefly consider this allegation on the part of quantum mechanics that quantum mechanics can and has explained all experimental evidence. Well, to begin with, obviously that's not true. I mean, they can't explain the Kaiser interferometry experiment. But aside from that, the way in which quantum mechanics explains things is not scientific. For example, John Wheeler sat around and he dwelled and thought for a long time and came up with various peculiarities that would flow from the idea of wave-particle duality. One of them is what's called the wheeler gedanken experiment in which it is shown that if wave-particle duality were true, then time would have to go backwards, i.e., an effect would precede its cause. That experiment was eventually done and published, and the results were what Wheeler predicted. Another one of Wheeler's ideas was what's called the quantum eraser. And if Wheeler's idea was correct, then time would have to go backwards. A effect would precede its cause. And that experiment was also eventually designed and executed, and the results were what Wheeler predicted. So these experiments were published, and it was said, you see, quantum mechanics can explain all this, but there's all this quantum weirdness. Well, that's the wrong way to think. The way science has traditionally thought for hundreds of years is that if you come up with results that make no sense, then your premises, your starting assumptions, are wrong. If you come up with experimental results which prove that if wave-particle duality is true, then time would have to go backwards and effects would have to precede their cause, then that proves that wave-particle duality is not true. So if quantum mechanics experts approach the empirical world willing to swallow any nonsense and call it quantum weirdness, then they have produced a theory that cannot be contradicted by experimental evidence because it simply absorbs the contradiction into itself like a giant amoeba. And the problem is if you have a theory that cannot be contradicted by empirical evidence, then that is not science. That is a belief system. It is not refutable. Scientific ideas, by definition, are refutable by empirical data. And by that definition, quantum mechanics is not a science. This is the fifth lesson in a video systematically explaining elementary wave theory. This lesson will be focused on the Purcell effect. Although the next lesson, number six, explaining complementarity in a stern gerlach magnet experiment is my favorite, I'm very fond of this one also about the Purcell effect. The Purcell effect means that a particle such as an excited atom inside a resonant cavity will decay more rapidly if the diameter of the cavity is resonant with the wavelength of the emitted photon and it will decay much more slowly if it is not resonant. This is what the word resonant means if we move from light waves to sound waves. If the wavelength is perfect for that size cavity, it resonates. Here are the articles which present the data that we are about to discuss. Here's the equipment we're going to talk about. On the left-hand side, a furnace heats up and produces a stream of hot alkali atoms, cesium or sodium, and then a laser excites the outermost electron of those atoms and kicks it to a higher energy level, which is why it's called a Rydberg atom. The excited atoms then enter the red circle, which is a micro cavity, 
which will be the central focus of our discussion. So this micro cavity shown as a red circle is very small and very cold. It's less than a couple of hundred micrometers in diameter and its temperature is below six degrees Kelvin. Inside the micro cavity, the outer electron either falls to a lower energy state or doesn't. And if it does, it emits a photon carrying the difference in energy. That photon has a certain wavelength lambda, which we will talk about shortly. Then the hot atoms continue their course out through the right hand side of the microcavity into various other equipment in which it is assessed whether they do or do not continue to have an excited electron in the outer orbit. So the inference is made that if the electron lost its energy and it emitted a photon inside the cavity, it no longer has that to be tested outside and vice versa. Thus the equipment to the right is how they figure out what happened inside the cavity. Now inside the cavity, the whole question is, what is the diameter of the cavity relative to the wavelength lambda of the photon which would be emitted if the electron fell to a lower energy level? It turns out that it is decisively important whether the diameter of the cavity is some multiple of lambda over 2 or not. If the diameter of the cavity is just right, it is called resonant. It turns out that the electrons will fall to a lower energy level 500 times more frequently than if the atom were not in a micro cavity. And if it is wrong, if the diameter of the cavity is wrong, it will inhibit the electron falling to a lower energy level by the factor of 1 to 20. You may wonder, what is that wire doing inside the micro cavity? Well, under ideal conditions, it would be good to change the diameter of the cavity during the experiment, but things are simply too small to fiddle with them like that, so they put the wire in to use the stark effect to change the wavelength of the lambda. The result, however, is the same, which is that if you have a diameter of the cavity which is perfect, a, a multiple of lambda over 2, then you have 500 times as much emission of photons, whereas if the diameter of the cavity is wrong, you have inhibited the photons by 20 to 1. It's simply a description of the Purcell effect, which is well known to physicists, but less well known to psychiatrists. But the question is, why does it happen? How does the excited atom inside that microcavity know what the diameter of the cavity is? That's an important question. Physicists dodge the question by having all kinds of other words that they append to it without addressing the question like, how does it happen? They say, for example, that it's due to how many radiator modes there are per unit volume, or the relationship between an excited atom and a vacuum, or an interaction between the electrical images of the atom reflected in the cavity mirrors. But all of these are just words. They are a way of avoiding thinking about the basic issue, which is how the heck does the atom know how big the space is that it is in? I mean, you can't say that it's quantum waves that measure it, because until the atom disintegrates and emits a photon, there are no quantum waves to go out and measure the diameter of the cavity. And for sure, you're not going to say, well, the photon goes out, finds it's the wrong size cavity, and goes back in. How does the atom know how big the darn cavity is? Well, it's very simple, which is that you've got to have something like elementary waves measuring the diameter of the cavity and inviting the photon to be emitted at exactly the right lambda. Now you could say, we don't need the term elementary wave. We have a perfectly adequate term, non-local, to explain how the atom knows that it's the right size cavity. I mean, that's like saying we don't need the word light. We have a perfectly adequate word, non-darkness. No one is going to be inspired to do new research based on the term non-darkness, whereas the word light inspires people to think about, well, what is it? 
Similarly, if we use the word elementary wave coming from this detector to this excited atom, there are all kinds of questions that will be inspired. Does it go in a straight line? At what speed does it go? Does it go through barriers? Is it bent by gravity? If, on the other hand, you say this excited atom is inspired by non-locality, that language is so vague that nobody will think about it further. No one will be inspired to do new research. Now, if you investigate further the things I've been telling you about the Purcell effect, you will discover that we have not only shown that the Purcell effect demonstrates elementary waves, it also demonstrates that those waves come from the environment to the excited atom, that photons follow them backwards, that these waves are of all wavelengths, and that they come in all directions. All that you can learn by studying the Purcell effect. Now, there's a more specific way in which this is important. There's a fellow named Johann Balmer, who was Swiss and taught mathematics in the 19th century, and who studied the spectral lines of hydrogen as quantified by Angstrom. And this fellow Balmer found that there was a mathematical formula that showed where these spectral lines would be. Here's his equation. And this equation is a more specific example of the more general Rydberg equation. Now, these two equations are mathematical, duh, and you will find in what I'm about to say that, of course, it's the same mathematics whether you talk about elementary waves or not, which illustrates one of the basic themes. The theme is that quantum mathematics is the same in the elementary wave universe as in the quantum universe. Here you see the origin of Balmer's spectral lines based on the Rutherford-Bohr model of the hydrogen atom. Electrons fall from excited orbits 5, 4, and 3 down to orbit 2, thereby losing energy and emitting photons of a certain wavelength. This is another way of drawing the same thing. And then this next diagram shows the elementary wave explanation that elementary waves at the bottom come in at different wavelengths. They become the trajectory of photons following them backwards at a subsequent point, and elementary waves go from the lower energy to the higher energy level, and they become the trajectories for electrons falling to the lower energy, then triggering a photon to leave the atom. As we indicated in Lesson 3, Elementary waves and energy flow in opposite directions. This has been the fifth of seven lessons explaining my best understanding of elementary wave theory. In this video, we have used the Purcell effect to demonstrate what elementary waves are. This is lesson six out of seven in the effort to systematically explain elementary wave theory, we are going to present an elementary wave perspective on complementarity in a stern gerlach magnet experiment. First, we will describe how the experiment works from a quantum mechanics point of view, and then we will give the elementary wave reinterpretation. This is a stern gerlach magnet. Because of the knife edge at the bottom of the N pole, there is a gradient in the magnetism in the center of the magnet, and when a stream of hot silver atoms is shot through the center of the magnet, it is divided into those with spin up versus spin down. If we lay the magnet on its side, then it's divided into spin to the right versus spin to the left. We call Z the vertical axis and X the horizontal axis. The four magnets in question are arranged as you see. The central focus is on the two magnets in the middle, Z plus and Z minus. Let's start by saying that we do not know which route the silver atoms took, going from the Z plus to the Z minus magnets, whether they went across the top or the bottom. Then we will have one spot on the final target screen on the right. But on the other hand, if we do know which route the silver atoms took, then we will have two spots on the target screen. So this is complementarity. Somehow we get different results if we know or if we don't know 
which route is used by the silver atoms in the middle of this experiment. However, it's obvious that what I just said is nonsense. Because if no one's paying attention, or the experiment is done sometime in some place where there's no one around to be aware of the results, you get the same results. So whether people know or don't know what goes on between those two middle magnets, that does not explain the phenomenon in question. Which is why Feynman calls it the central mystery of quantum mechanics, because the usual explanation is nonsense. It just doesn't hang together. Now we're going to have a detector in the middle of our experiment, which is this little eyeball uh, sitting down at the bottom. And that will tell us whether the silver atoms went across in the lower pathway or the upper pathway. Because when they say we know or we don't know, it means there was a detector down there. Now these detectors don't just watch. They have to put out a small amount of energy. And it seems kind of obvious that we should suspect that that energy from the detector is an artifact which is causing the phenomenon that we are looking at. Now, from the point of view of quantum mechanics, it can't be explained that way because the amount of energy put out by the detector is infinitesimal as opposed to the huge amount of energy from the silver atoms zooming through. The quantum mechanics approach is basically mathematical. If we let psi plus minus of s sub x be the amplitude that the spin be measured s sub x, given that the silver atoms pass through the upper plus or lower minus pathway of the z plus z minus pair of magnets, then if we don't know which route, the top or bottom route of the z plus z minus pair of magnets, then the probability of s sub x equal to plus is 1, as you can see in the top half of this slide. If, on the other hand, you do know which route was used between the z plus z minus pair of magnets, then the probability is 1 half, as you can see in the middle. So if we compare these two results, we find that if we don't know which route is used, then the probability is 1. Whereas if we do know, then the probability is 1 half. The difference between these two equations is what is the distribution of the red bars. So what it comes down to is that we use two different ways to calculate the probability. If the route across the z plus z minus pair of magnets is not known, then we add the amplitudes, and after we've added them, then we square them to get the probability. On the other hand, if the route between z plus z minus is known, then we square each amplitude to get the probability, and then add those two probabilities. That is simply saying in words what is shown in mathematical symbols in this slide. So in order to figure out the elementary wave explanation of complementarity, we have to first establish what is the elementary wave view of the stern gerlach magnet experiment in question. One of the most incredible things about these elementary waves is that they carry intrinsic spin, and therefore they interact with stern gerlach magnets. Elementary waves start at the target screen find their way backwards through all four magnets, and if they can reach the oven or furnace, then they do so, and a silver atom will eventually follow that wave backwards and make a point on the target screen at that point from which the wave originated. So we want to focus on whether these elementary waves from the target screen can snake their way through all four magnets and reach the oven. And it turns out sometimes they can, and sometimes they cannot do so. When they cannot do so, it's exactly the same results as you find with quantum mechanics. There will be no dot on the target screen, and when they can do so, when the elementary wave from a certain position, say x plus, can find its way through all four magnets to the furnace, then there will be a visible mark on the target screen. 
In the past, I made a mistake trying to understand and explain complementarity. It seemed to me that the detector uh, down here is putting out a small, perhaps insignificant amount of energy, and yet that much energy, although small, is greater than zero, and therefore greater than the elementary wave trying to get through on the lower trajectory and therefore the energy would block it. And thus you would have an elementary ray going through one route and not the other, and I thought that would explain the data. But that was wrong, obviously, because there are about the same number of silver atoms coming across the top and bottom route, even when the detector present. So the silver atoms can't come across the bottom route without following elementary waves backwards. So let's rethink the whole thing. The map that allows us to understand the world of elementary rays is quantum mathematics. And what does the quantum mathematics tell us? To calculate the probability, first, if there is no detector, add the amplitudes and then square them. But if there is a detector, square each amplitude and then add them. That's what the mathematics says. To me, that says that if there's no detector present, the x plus and x minus intrinsic spin elementary waves come into the z plus z minus pair of magnets. The important thing to remember is that in the absence of a detector, the z plus z minus pair of magnets act as if they are not present. The elementary wave just goes straight through there as if there were nothing there. Elementary waves are like a river flowing in this direction. If it comes to an island, it simply goes around it and merges together downstream, and you would never know the island had been there. In this case, the island is named Z plus Z minus magnets. And then when they go into the final magnet just before the furnace, the elementary wave with an intrinsic spin of X plus can go through, but the elementary wave with a spin of X minus cannot penetrate through the final X magnet before the furnace because the minus port of that magnet has been blocked. For these reasons, if there's no detector, the final data will show a mark on the target screen at X plus, but no mark at X minus. However, if there is a detector present, then it affects the bottom ray. When there is a detector present in the experiment, it changes the lower ray in terms of its ability to interact with the upper ray. I've portrayed the upper ray as blue and the lower one as magenta. They are no longer cooperative. They are no longer harmonious. The upper and lower ray no longer work as a team. The upper ray with an intrinsic spin of Z plus is able to enter the final magnet on the left and there it requires an X plus intrinsic spin. Similarly, the lower elementary ray with an intrinsic spin of Z minus is able to enter the final magnet on the left and it also requires there a spin of X plus which allows them to get into the oven and therefore silver atoms will follow them backwards. The net result is that with a detector present, there is an elementary ray stretching all the way from X plus on the target screen over to the oven, and another one stretching from X minus on the target screen all the way over to the oven, and therefore there will be marks on the target screen at both points. That explains the data in a way that is consistent with the quantum mathematics. There is a simple experiment that will allow you to discover how this detector has such a big effect on this experiment. First, pay attention or then be distracted by a text message. You'll find that that makes no difference in the experiment, quite different than if you are distracted by a text message while you're driving a car. Second, try turning off the electricity you will discover that that makes a huge difference. Therefore, it is the energy radiated by the detector, even though it's a small amount of energy, which is how this detector affects this experiment. The beauty of elementary wave theory is that we have this map, which is quantum mathematics. Unlike quantum mechanics, which has the same mathematics, but treats it as so abstract 
in Hilbert space that you can't quite figure out where it is, we have the same mathematics but the challenge to envision it in this space here, Cartesian space, where we live. The mathematics of this experiment does not tell us that the one ray is damaged by the detector. What it tells us is that because of the detector, the two rays are unable to cooperate, coordinate. If there is a detector in the experiment, the elementary rays flow like a river and they come to an island and go around, but there's no downstream's end to this island. They become separate streams and go off in different directions, no longer relating to each other. This is the seventh and last lesson in this video systematically explaining elementary wave theory. Here we will attempt to summarize everything. So in summary, there are two symmetrical universes which contradict each other. Only one of the two can exist. On the one hand, there is the quantum mechanics universe in which waves and particles go in the same direction. And on the other hand, there is the elementary wave universe in which they go in opposite directions. Now we claim that both these universes have the same mathematics. Let's take an example of that. In the double slit experiment, according to quantum mechanics, the probability amplitude of a dot appearing at point X on the target screen is A plus B, depending on whether the particle came through slit A or slit B. Now those are complex numbers and when you add them together and square them, you get a lot of quantum interference. Now, on the other hand, in the elementary wave theory, any particular point X on the target screen will produce a probability amplitude at the electron gun of A plus B, depending on whether the wave came through slit A or slit B. When you square that, you get the same pattern as you did with the same mathematics as in the quantum mechanics approach. The electron sitting in the electron gun must make a decision which wave to respond Two, which it does in proportion to the probability with which that wave presents itself, which is based on the wave interference. If the electron decides to latch onto this particular elementary ray and follow it backwards, it doesn't matter which slit it goes through, the electron will follow that ray with a probability of one and inevitably make a dot at that point X from which that wave is coming and therefore the pattern on the target screen is the same with elementary wave theory as in quantum mechanics. It's based on the mathematics of two complex numbers added together, A plus B, and in order to find the probability you have to square that sum. In the double slit experiment the interference of the waves going through each of the two slits is found in proximity to the electron gun. But now, if we introduce a detector into the experiment so that we can find out which slit was used, suddenly things have changed. The energy in the detector, although small, is greater than the energy of the elementary waves, and it somehow changes that wave. So now you have the upper ray going in proximity to the detector and somehow being modified in the lower ray Somehow and for some reason, these rays can no longer coordinate. They no longer make any constructive or destructive interference. They are like independent rays, each one with its own integrity, making a bid for the electron to follow it backwards, but not as a team, not as a partnership. They used to be partners having interference and jointly making a bid for the electron. Not anymore. It's sort of like a married couple who get along very well and do everything together in harmony until one of them is unfaithful and is seen naked by a detector. And then from then on, they don't coordinate at all. They're not in harmony. It would be very sad except for the fact that it's just a metaphor I made up right here. So you have the same kind of complementarity mathematics that we had 
in the stern gerlach magnet experiment, namely that instead of adding two amplitudes and then squaring them, if there is a detector in the experiment, then that changes the mathematics and we have to square each of the amplitudes and then add them together. Let's get oriented and remember where we are in this seventh and last lesson. We've been comparing two universes, the quantum universe and the elementary wave universe. We've shown examples of how they both have the same mathematics, but the logic of the waves, I mean, either the waves go in one direction or the other, they can't do both. So we have to choose which universe is preferable. There are a variety of reasons for thinking that the elementary wave universe is preferable because basically it looks like the universe I know. It looks like home. This is familiar. The quantum universe has got too many weird things that just don't look like reality. Since quantum mathematics is consistent with both universes, both ways of understanding nature, and since those two ways of nature contradict each other, it's necessary to decide whether quantum mechanics is the logical way to m make sense out of the universe we live in. And we say, yes, quantum mathematics is the logical way, but no, the assumptions of quantum mechanics are wrong. Your friends are going to tell you you are insane. If you listen to this guy who says that everything about your body, everything about the world around you is determined by particles following zero energy waves backwards. Ha! Ah! Well, that brings us to the final central message of this video. The most important thing that I have to tell you, which is that just because you're insane does not mean you're wrong.